In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. This morning's uh, readings are like the readings that occur as we approach the season of Advent. The season of Advent, of course, is the season of Christ's coming. Both the commemoration of his first coming in the birth of Christ, and a looking forward to his second coming, empowering great glory. And so a lot of the readings are apocalyptic uh, in origin, which I suppose for some people is appropriate on the heels of a presidential election. That's <laughs> all you're going to hear from me about that, by the way. Maybe a little, maybe a little more uh, as it relates to what we have read today. But nonetheless, we are, as we approach this season of Advent, we are reminded that history is moving in a direction. It's not just constant circles, but that God has put in place a plan for this world, and all of history is the working out of his plan. And though it is a plan that is not without its trials and tribulations and setbacks and bumps and disasters and all of those things, nonetheless, nothing stops it. It continues on, just as he is ordained. And it comes to its completion in Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in his glorious and triumphant return. And it is in him and in his return and in the completion of the plan that he has set in place that we are called to place our hope. We say, uh, or we, we, we prayed about hope in the colic for this morning. We, Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. So we are called to hold fast to this blessed hope, and that it comes to us through the learning that we have been given through the scriptures. I'm reminded of that little Sunday school song that everybody knows. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's easy for us in our maturity and sophistication to laugh at such a simple little song. But I suggest that it holds the key to understanding the collect that we just prayed. For the song tells us two things. One, that Jesus loves us. And two, we know this because the Bible tells us. And our colleague prays that as we engage God's word, that we would hold fast to the Christian hope. And what is this Christian hope? It is most simply that Jesus loves us and has a glorious plan for us and for this entire creation. And so there you have it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. If we look in the dusty basement of the Book of Common Prayer, called Historical Documents, and probably few of you have looked at it because the print is so small that nobody can read it, but we find these old statements of belief, one of which is called the 39 Articles of Religion. The 39 Articles are sort of Anglican foundational uh, belief statements that came out of the Reformation period. And Article 6 states that the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God and contain all things necessary to salvation. What are these necessary things? Well, the Bible is the record of God's dealings with humankind. It is the Word of God written. God speaking to us through human authors. And it tells the greatest love story in the world. That of the God of a people who, in spite of their efforts to get him to do otherwise, stubbornly loved them and made provision for them to be his people. Even as he exercised great and terrible judgments upon them, he was not doing so to destroy them, but to refine and purify them calling them to repent and to come back to him so that they could be his people and he could be their God. And the great climax of this story is 
when God finally unfolded the final part of this revelation, when he would empty himself of his glory and majesty and come down to us as one of us. This God-made man would not only take our human nature upon him, but would also take all of the rebellious and sinful acts ever done. He took that upon himself. And he bore that on the cross, bearing the weight of judgment and separation from God that those sins cause. And because of that, we can, in Jesus, be joined to God forever and be called his children. And the Holy Spirit is sent to each of us as the gift of the Father to seal us in this relationship and to guide us into all truth. This is the hope to which we are called as Christians. This is the hope which the Holy Scriptures were written to nourish within us. The, the hope that it is not up to us to move things forward in God's plan. The good news is that in a world torn by wars and conflicts, one day the king will return and make all things right. And the justice for which we so long and fight now will become an accomplished fact and a permanent feature of our world. In a world where hunger and poverty dominate the lives of so many, we have the great hope that a king our king will come and, and eliminate hunger and need altogether. In a world where we look in the mirror and wonder how it is that God could love somebody like us, it's a great hope to know that in Christ, God sees us and loves us not only for who we are now, but for who we will become in Christ as he works his will and his plan in us and through us. This is hope, and hope is a precious commodity these days. Again, to wander into dangerous territory, all you have to do is read the paper or look on the internet or watch TV, and you discover that in the event of this latest election, you have people who are filled to the brim with hope, but you also have people who have lost all hope, it seems. And as Christians... We must live together in the midst of that and all recognize that ultimately our hope and our trust is in no man or woman of this earth, but in the God-man, Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hope is a precious commodity these days, and the letter to the Hebrews even calls this hope an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. In these treacherous times, we need to know where to go in order to find this hope. Otherwise, we might be led astray, just as Jesus talked about in today's gospel. For many will come and say, I am he. And the unsuspecting and untaught will go running after them. The Bible is the wellspring of that truth and that hope. For in it we read of the God who loves us. We read of a holy God who loves us, and we read of how it is that we are to believe and live towards that holy God. And so it would be much to our spiritual malnourishment if we were to neglect these awesome writings. <coughs> the Collex prays that we might hear, read, mark, learn, inwardly digest God's holy word. The instruction and hope that the Bible imparts to us is only available to the person who would do these very things. Just as a Christmas gift is useless to the one who never unwraps it, or the meal is useless to the one who never eats it, so is an unopened and unread Bible. The Word of God will have no effect in our lives unless we attend to it carefully. Now, hearing it in church is vital and a foundational, uh, for the Bible really is the book of the church, but the church is also the church of the Bible. And she submits herself to its teachings. So it is that we who are the church's members are called to engage in the reading, marking, and learning of these holy books. That we may hold fast to the hope that is found within them. And we not only read, but we inwardly digest. Just as we eat food slowly and carefully that it may break down properly and nourish 
all of our, uh, all of our body in the same way we, we slowly uh, and frequently read and ponder the scripture, that it may seep into our souls and nourish the depths of our intellect, our will, and our emotions. If we are faithful in this, we will be strengthened by the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And there are a million different ways to do this. Where do we start? Where do we begin? Uh, well, just start with Genesis and read all the way through. No, don't do that. It never works. Uh, it does occasionally. It never worked for me. The church even gives us guidance in that as well. The daily offices of morning and evening prayer contain a calendar for reading almost the entire Bible through in the course of the year. And so it gives us a wonderful opportunity not to have to ask the question, well, what do I want to read today? Because the calendar is laid out there for us and it gives us this, this broad exposure to, to the, the Word of God. And we don't have to randomly pick uh, what it is that we read. But the most important thing, regardless of what method or what calendar or, or anything, is that we open the book and that we open ourselves to the book in order that we might hear the voice of God speaking to us. So often we are uh, very quick to speak to God, to tell Him things, to ask Him things, but slow to listen to His voice when it tells us something or asks something of us. The primary way in which we listen to that voice is not through our hunches or our inner promptings, although that's a part of it, it is as we hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the word that he speaks to us. And anchor our soul in the hope that is found therein. A typical Episcopalian story is told, and I'm sure I've said it before, but it bears repeating a hundred times, because it's a great uh, story of the old man who was a faithful member of his church his, his whole life. He never missed a Sunday he always went to the liturgy. He loved the services of the church. And on his deathbed, uh, he realized that he was about to go meet God. And so he thought he should become familiar with the book that God wrote, since he'd never really read the Bible much of his life. So he opened the book, and he read a few verses, and he, in surprise, he exclaimed, Wow, this quotes the Book of Common Prayer quite a lot. <laughs> Let's not wait until our deathbed to partake of the hope that is offered to us in God's holy word. Let us hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scriptures so that from now until we depart this life, we may hold fast to the hope of eternal life with God. And that that hope may fuel and strengthen us in this life. What a great hope it is to know that Jesus Christ loves us, and that we don't have to rely on hunches, feelings, or experiences to know it, because the kids have had it right all along. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.